Okay, I uh, wanted to shoot a little video on a pheasant habitat and propagating PowerPoint that I presented this year at a local pheasant banquet. Um, on my YouTube channel, I have a 2018 one, and uh, this one here in 2019, I have 30 to 40 percent new information on it. So, um, why don't we get started? And I'll uh, walk you through the PowerPoint here. Uh, here's some simple chick raising techniques and, ch and tips. It's basically the same as as um, other other birds around the farm, keep them warm, keep them safe from rodents, proper feed, and fresh and dry. Here's a picture of my brooders. The red arrow is pointing to some panels that I use to trap the heat in, and I let the birds um, dictate if how close they are to the heat lamp. I need to be warmer or colder, and then um, I have two doors. The large one you can see there is the jump in with a scoop shovel, clean it out, and this one here is feed water, put them in there, whatever, simple things. And then I lay a scrap piece of plywood or cardboard underneath the water, helps keep the straw out. Next is a fly pen, keep everything out of it, of course, adequate feed and water. And then I just, you, you could drape netting around many structures or old barns. Here's a picture of my, um, my uh, fly pen, a little blurry, this one here is clear. Um, plywood around the bottom is to keep things from reaching in. Um, that's another thing you have to keep in mind with any netting or chicken wire is something could reach through and try to catch the birds. They like to sleep on the edge of it. The most important part of, of raising for survival is to create some, some ha um, habitat essentially in there for them to hide in. Use large feeders and waters, less time around them. And the most important part is um, get them out prior to six weeks, right at six weeks max. I let mine out at five and a half, otherwise they get cannibalistic when they're that, when they're that confined and it's not good. Habitat, I have a couple different topics here that I'll talk about. Hinge cutting, probably the best thing I do for creating cover for pheasants as of right now. It's just people have been doing it for 20 years with deer and I started doing it three or four years ago for pheasants. Cutting a tree halfway through so it keeps growing when you lay it down. It'll re-sprout, it'll let sunlight go to work, create weeds and other stuff. And basically, there's nowhere that trees grow that I won't do it to, cr to create um, cover. And just undesirable tree species or any tree that's leaning, um, you know, it wouldn't make a log or wouldn't make decent firewood. I just lay it down. And then uh, it's the exact same habitat prior to me hinge cutting on the left. Um, it's not even winter yet, and the untouched habit is nearly nothing. Bring the trees to the ground, trees and sunlight to the ground, so they can go to work. Um, the right, the left looked exactly like the right before I hinge cut it. Here's a picture of sun and weeds going to work, and then there's a picture of late August, and it's already bare on the ground. And we're not even to winter yet. So then another technique: edge feathering. Taking the edge of a woods and laying it out into a CRP field or just a grass field or just making a barrier around the edge of the woods really let the sunlight kind of shine in there and the trees create some cover themselves. Lion fences, every single one across this country could use some help. Every single lion fence out there could be thickened up on the ground. Picture on the right of nothing, picture on the left after a hinge cut. It's not thick enough where it's like a brush pile where predators could hole up and it's just thick enough to create cover. There's a picture of just on its own, and there, then there's a closer up picture of when I laid a bunch of trees down. It's really a win-win. I mean, you take the shade off the crop, and you bring the, the, the cover to the ground for wildlife. It's um, really a win-win for farmers, for landowners. There's just nobody loses um, improving a line fence like this. Food plotting, feed, cover, hunting, keeping the flock healthy. I plant a few different grains. Drone picture of some plots I do. Um, I learned real quick that there's no need to be picky about shape or or nothing. Just use what what nature gives you easy to work with. You know, not steep or or not too much thick stuff you have to take out. Just use what use what you can. And there's another picture. Leave the thick stuff. Plant the the simple to to grub to grub out the grass stuff. Um, the thing I plant the most of is bird food. Of course, it's got sorghum, millet, sunflowers in it. The exact bag pictured here I buy and get it on sale pretty cheap. I planted it for two years and I just smile every time I check it. So many people told me it wouldn't grow. It's got the seed coating, you know, so it don't mold, yada, yada, yada. And I just, I just laugh about it. I love it. It's cheap. It's awesome. 
Um, spread it on some bare ground, drag it in, about 20 pounds an acre, spread out evenly. It grows various millets, sorghum, sunflowers, and they're planted right before rain, and it shoots up and beats most of the weeds quite easily. Okay, some great bare ground for a hen to bring some chicks in there or for you to turn some birds out into. Uh, late summer, we're packed full of winter feed. There's um, some five grains that I picked out of it, a couple millets and grain sorghum there on the right. Another picture of uh, just how much food and cover it really creates. And then I spice some of the plots up with some sunflowers, again, meant for bird food, but they sprout, they grow, they look pretty, the bees love them. Uh, grain sorghum, basically just make it bare and drag it in. Pretty simple stuff. There's another drone picture of the grain sorghum patch. Uh, we, ha we have record snowfall this year, or nearly, two inches from it, still snowing today, April 11th. It's pretty crazy. But um, this is early February. It didn't really start snowing until about the 20th of January this year. It was really crazy. Uh, Mid-February, it kept snowing. Still had cover. And, um, yeah, we got hit with a huge blizzard at the end of February, and it just obliterated the plot. It was sad to look at it. But this is why I try to do a vast array of habitat projects. Some things fail certain years, certain weather. Plant some corn. I did not get all worked up and freaked out about adding fertilizer. I'm growing corn for wildlife, not 250 bushel corn. So I didn't believe the hype. I planned it and it surprised me. I planned this little patch here. Quite poor quality ground. Really an old pasture turned up a lot of sand and it still grew pretty good ears and, and the deer completely wiped it out. So they got good use of it this winter. And um, Trying a brand new technique, overseeding cereal rye between the rows. Corn stalks will, add, will act as cover, and uh, the cereal rye will act as more cover between the rows. And I hope to do this on a big enough plot where I can leave the corn for two years with ears on it. This one obviously got um, mowed out by the deer, but it'll still be a good experiment. And then here's a different cereal rye patch that I planted in September. It's, I've never I've never planted it until two years ago. It's really quite interesting to watch it watch it grow and create. Good deer, deer feed when it's young and good cover as it goes throughout early nesting season. And of course, grass uh, grass burning, um, make it thicker, better bare ground. And here's a picture for um, picture of us burning into a backfire. You can kind of do some research on that, how to burn into something you've already burned, playing the wind. And then here's a property that we're trying to thicken up the grass between the strips that uh, the, the guy sold himself. Well, overseed some forbs and different grasses in between those strips. And there's a picture of the barrier we made and what burned and what didn't. Our goal is to make that all together one one patch. We planted some natives and um, the weeds obviously had a lot of start in it because it's a former ag field. Weed pressure was pretty heavy but the broadleaf spray for a pasture, cattle pasture, took out all the broadleaves which is Pretty neat to watch the grass fill in after that was took out. Um, two years and I've got blue stem over my head, so I can't wait to see what see what this summer brings. Rotational grazing, um, split off 30% of this particular pasture and cut that in half. And um, one of those halves, we were able to leave till the beginning of uh, beginning of August. So, so that was uh, that was pretty neat. There's a drone picture of of uh, rotational grazing, another picture. Tree planting, um, borrowed this tree planter from the guy that puts on the banquet. It's really, really quite a neat little rig. Uh, marked them with a flag and rigged up a tank and five gallon pails to water them. Um, I also bought a bunch, bunch of, bunch of uh, trees from this website. Um, ordered 500 of them. I didn't plant all of them. I actually resold some of them for 40 cents a piece. So five trees for two bucks, and um, I made I think three cents a tree after shipping. So that was kind of a good deal to get the trees to good homes. Uh, winter feeding, great chance to monitor the flock on trail cameras. Um, every little thing adds up. I try to work with my neighbors on um, food plotting, hinge cutting, or maybe just feeding too. Um, on our farm, 2016 our combine flush 12, 2017 it was all up to 21, last year it was only 15, but it was a rough fall, it had rain delays and breakdowns, and we'd start a field and we'd get rained out, and we'd start a field and we'd break down, and just different fields had pheasants, I could hear them and see them in them all year, they weren't there when we picked it, because we picked it so weird, and and the number don't mean much, um, to me, 
I jumped uh, several several groups of pheasants all year and seen two separate second hatch broods in one day on completely different ends of the farm. That was my first lifetime sighting ever of second hatch broods. That was awesome to see a hen leading a bunch of little chicks around in August. So, recap habitat. I've got a couple techniques there that are cheap and instantly effective, and then I've got a couple uh, techniques listed there that are investing for the long haul. Um, scouting, I scout as often as I can year-round, try to always eye up what they're doing, what they're in, what works for them, what they're using, trail cameras in person. Every single acre can be improved in some way, and hope that provided an answer for any of your problem areas that you'd like to improve. Predator control, here's a couple coyotes I took out. Literally everything wants a piece of the pheasant or its nest. Here's some of my all-time favorite trail cam photos, and I have a couple videos to share with you too quickly here. There's a rooster heading right into some beautiful grain sorghum. And then here's a three-year success story. Um, three years ago I started feeding pheasants grain in front of a trail camera on a, a farm that we rent. It's a shelter belt that he planted 30 years ago. Two roosters and a hen the first year, the second year was one hen and one to three roosters, and then this year it was six hens and a couple of roosters. So that was pretty neat to see that many, that much breeding power. Um, here's probably my all-time favorite trail cam video of pheasants that I've, that I've ever collected. You can see the hen in the top left here, and she burrows right into the grain sorghum almost like a rabbit to get, to get, uh, get out of the, get out of the weather. I think that's, uh, <laughs> Pretty cool, I'll let it play here one more time. There she goes, barrels right in there. Um, that's how I had a trail camera up on a dust bathing site. And uh, here's a couple hens and a couple of roosters. Having a big old time, scratching and fluffing and doing what they do on dust baths. Then I have a picture of some uh, ladies getting a little excited around the dust bath. Dancing and strutting and fluffing and having a big time. It's something they don't get to see too often that close. But uh, yeah, if you're interested in bringing pheasants to your property, I challenge you to do two out of three or what, I've, what I covered here, uh, raise and release, habitat management of any type, and predator control altogether. You can make your pheasants great again. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for listening and watching if you're still with me. Um, this is 30 to 40 percent new, like I said, compared to last year's 2018. If you're interested, you can watch that too. I also have a bunch of videos that walk through different food plots I have more in depth on um, on what they look like in certain types of times of the year. But thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day wherever you are. Thanks again.